everyone. Welcome back to the Fandom Zone podcast. I'm Charles Skaggs, one of your co-hosts here on the Fandom Zone, as we're talking more of the Boys Season 2, as we get ever closer to the Boys Season 2 finale. And I'm joined once again, of course, by my wonderful co-host, wonderful pal from across the pond, shall we say, and just a generally a nice guy. DJ Nick, how you doing, Nick? Hey, Charles. I'm doing very, very well, thank you. Super happy to be with you once again. I always look forward to uh, Monday. I always love recording. on. I always look forward to Mondays. Unlike Garfield, I'm a fan of Mondays these days. <laughs> You're a fan of Mondays. Well, that's good to know. So, uh, <laughs> yes, Mondays. It's going to be feeling a little weird, though, here in a couple of weeks when we're, we're after we've wrapped up. It will be. Yes. I'm going to feel terribly bereft, I tell you, unless we find something else to talk about. But... Well, I think I, I think we have something in mind, but not until January. Although, this is true. there's going to be a couple of episodes I probably want to do in the meantime, because we're, we'll still have episodes 199 and 200. Ooh, so close to 200. Yeah, so we should probably, because here at, we're right now, we're here at episode 197. As we talk mm. Butcher, Baker, Candlestick Maker, the seventh episode of The Boys Season 2 aired on October 2nd, 2020. So just last month, barely. So yeah, we've got episodes 198 and 199. So we'll do 198 next time. So that leaves 199 and 200. So maybe we should cook up something to figure some now because those are big episodes yeah so start thinking of something you'd like to do to kind of if you're interested and maybe you can bring jesse in and or whatever yes and, and make it a because nice he little should be part of this you should be part of this momentous occasion he should he should so i uh, don't think we've forgotten about jesse because we certainly haven't so yeah maybe we, we gotta start thinking about that just kind of keep that put that on the back burner for now because right now like I said, we're talking Butcher Baker, Candlestick Maker, which was written by Craig Rosenberg, who wrote the previous season two episode, Over the Hill with the Swords of a Thousand Men, probably my favorite episode title of the season, and also wrote the season one episodes of the Self-Preservation Society and the Female of the Species from season one, like I said, directed by Stefan Schwartz. May the Schwartz be with you. Spaceballs reference, couldn't resist, who uh, directed the season one episode, Good for the Soul, if you remember that. So, Nick, there's a lot going on in this one, as we kind of briefly discussed while I was running down our topics before we started recording. And we got a lot to talk about, sir. So, in general, what are your, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, as it often is the case with a an episode leading up to a season finale, the penultimate episode. There's a lot. Exactly. There's a lot to wrap up before you get to the big climax because everybody obviously is getting ready for the, for the, for the last episode. They're like, okay, so how are we going to get to showing everybody the, 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 you know, how all the storylines wrap up somewhat in the, in the, uh, in the last episode? So that it, obviously it is jam packed. I was actually surprised that it's the runtime is actually lower compared to previous episodes because I'd figured this would probably be an hour plus. Right. I think this was about 54 minutes, give or take. Um, but, but yeah, they were able to condense so much into roughly, roughly an hour. Cause I said, I believe the runtime is about 54, 55 minutes, but, uh, it's great story. That's still nothing to sneeze at though. 54 minutes is pretty good for, oh, totally, totally. I mean, especially when you think about like the CW shows, which with commer after commercials, after you take all the commercials out, probably run what 40 minutes. At best, yes. anymore. You're looking about three quarters of an hour thereabouts. Yes. Yeah. So that's still a good, uh, good, decent amount of programming. And unlike, you know, and unlike you know, certain shows that may run 45 minutes, where they 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 don't use the time wisely. Here, they are very, very um, good at dosing things. I, I should I should say it's uh, it's uh, so well done. I really enjoyed this. It's a great lead in. To what comes next? They were very thrifty when it comes to this. They they <laughs> they spent their time wisely, right? And and especially when you consider there's so much going on. But like you said, I think you're absolutely right that they delegated their time wisely and were very efficient about it. 
they touch on a lot of things, but they don't dwell on them. So therefore, I think you get a little bit more bang for your buck per minute in this episode. Very much so. I mean, it can it can go both ways because you are opening various doors. So it's then it's maybe even more challenging when you get to the finale of how do you wrap up all everything that's, that you've put out there. But so far, yeah, you know, pr- pretending that we haven't seen the finale just yet, it is very very well orchestrated. Oh yeah, yeah. We we never we didn't see the finale. No, what what no. what finale? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> all right. There's another episode. <laughs> Who knew, right? Well, I'm surprised. You know, I guess we'll just have to wait and be surprised like everybody else, right? <laughs> like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. There was a few actors I wanted to mention as guest cast this time. Some pretty notable ones. Uh, mm-hmm. John Noble, in particular. John Noble playing Sam Butcher, Billy Butcher's father, which I love the casting in this one. Oh, Yes. Big John Noble fan. He, of course, played Denethor in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah, it was a nice little Lord of the Rings get together there between, um, of course, Eomer and Denethor. Carl Urban, nice. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty brilliant. I get it, that, okay, so maybe it wasn't as good as it could have been because, well, Denethor and Eomer weren't related in Lord of the Rings. No, true. But it's a nice, you know, representing Rohan and representing Gondor. I thought that was kind of cool. Very nice. Look at Nick all up in his Lord of the Rings. Look at you. <laughs> nice. Uh, Nick gets the one ring to rule them all this episode. Thank you. I try. <laughs> Being a Tolkien fan for that long pays off, I guess. Excellent. Yes. Uh, maybe we need to talk about those movies one of these days. But I got to become a I was a I became a huge John Noble fan in addition to Lord of the Rings, but uh, Fringe that he was on played, yes. a, played a character yes. named Doctor Walter Bishop, who I adored. He was essentially like the psychedelic drug taking version of the Doctor from Doctor Who, almost in a lot of ways. That Doctor Walter Bishop was was this brilliant physicist that mm-hmm. discovered you know, uh, parallel worlds. Yep. And as a result, uh, eventually crossed over to a parallel world to retrieve his dead son, like a, the, the parallel world version of his dead son, Peter, and brought him yep. back. But Walter Bishop was just such a fun character, a uh, fun, unpredictable character, completely unlike Denethor. Because you, you could Very love, so. you love to hate Denethor in Lord of the Rings, but you just loved Walter Bishop because he was always doing something crazy, something unexpected, and just a joy to, to uh, joy to watch. And I gather you're a fan of the series as well. Oh yes, and I and you know what? And the voice, John Noble is another man who's blessed with a beautiful voice. I would kill for his voice, seriously. Oh, you and me both. And of course, I do remember him as well as being the better part of Sleepy Hollow, the TV show. Yes. Yeah, he was that. And also, I've come to know him as I've been going, my wife Lori and I have been going back through Elementary, the Mm. CBS TV series, which is kind of like a modernized Sherlock Holmes. To Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, Yeah. not not like the um, the one, you know, it's essentially like a more Americanized version being on CBS than the BBC version with Benedict Cumberbatch. But he played Ah. a character named Moreland Holmes who was um, introduced as Sherlock's father. Oh, okay. And became a recurring character on the show. I mean, I don't want to digress too much here, Charles, but I mean, because I'm a huge, huge fan of the the Sherlock Holmes starring, of course, Bendit Cumberbatch. Is Elementary worth it? You know, for both my my benefit and for the listeners' benefit, if they're fans of Sherlock Holmes, should they check it out, in your opinion? I think they should. I think they should check it out. Now, personally, I prefer the Sherlock that stars Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman. But when, you know, you've burned through all those episodes, then check out Elementary. I think you'll find it, it's its its, its own thing. Johnny Lee Miller is a completely different Holmes, but he gives yeah. it his own spin. And they definitely play up the the recovering addict and angle with Holmes. In this ah, so more of the kind of heroin kind of thing compared to maybe uh, Cumberbatch. Yeah, because he regularly goes to meetings and whatnot, and he's constantly struggling with it. It, it gets addressed every so often. 
I mean, he's sober, wow. sober for the most part, but you know, and every rarely so often he does fall off the wagon. And oh, okay. so, so it, um, so it's a completely different take than Benedict's Cumberbatch's version. And I'm so looking forward to playing the new season of Sherlock that they've announced. Yeah, exactly. I know it's in the works. I am so looking forward. Fingers to crossed. That. Yeah, right. We'll see what happens. But um, and then he's got a you know um, Johnny Lee Miller. I know we need to get on, but Johnny Lee Miller has a, a, obviously a very different dynamic with Lucy Liu as his Watson in this. Yeah, of course, compared to Martin Freeman, and, that, and of course, yeah. They make it stands for reason. It does. Yeah. So so it's a completely different dynamic, and I but I think it's also equally valid if you're uh, looking for that modernized Sherlock Holmes take. <laughs> I'll check it out for sure. Right. Yeah, recommended. Check it out. See what you think. All right. So yeah, big fan of uh, of John Noble. Leslie Nickel plays Connie Butcher, and she might be familiar to people who are fans of the show Downton Abbey because, hey, she plays Mrs. Patmore. That's right. The ever-frazzled Mrs. Patmore, the, the kitchen <laughs> chef, kitchen cook. And, God bless uh, that woman, seriously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was, she's a, just a, you know, a joy to watch on Downton Abbey and um, very interesting to see her in this role. Uh, yeah. a, a, a complete change obviously because well hey she's a very talented actress and can do a number number of different types of roles but uh but it's definitely after seeing her for so long as mrs patmore it does take some adjusting to realize that she's playing butcher's mom in this and i believe she's actually british because i went and did my research when it came to um butcher's aunt yes and she's she's a canadian actress that's why the the accent didn't sit right with me well there you go i'm going look at uh, nick's doing his homework too that's looking oh, you came well, prepared you know, I can't sir kind of kind of kind of just sort of sit here and let you you know just drive and everything else and me just relax and i've got to do my homework too well i so. appreciate i appreciate that uh, <laughs> see i just wing it but you know uh nick's the responsible one i guess today <laughs> all right uh and john Dor. John Doman, excuse me. John Doman mm -hmm. plays Jonah Vogelbaum, and who is very important in the in the boys' comic mythos. And if you're a fan of the TV show Gotham from not too long ago, you probably yeah. recognize him, of course, as Carmine Falcone, or Falcone, yeah. depending on your pronunciation. Yes, but um, I always preferred Falcone, but that's me. That's actually closer to the, the Italian, if you will, because the Italian would be Falcone. Falcone? But, uh, okay. Yes, which is Big Falcon, which is basically yes. Falcon. Falcone, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he, you know, I loved him in that. He, he embraced the Italian mob boss so well. <laughs> <laughs> so you approved of his uh, portrayal? Oh, of Gotham. course, yes. Okay. I, was like, I was like, yes, because you're, you're a horrible person, but you're embracing that Italian spirit. Yeah. The only thing... <laughs> And I know we keep digressing here, but hey, it's us. So the only thing that kind of <laughs> disappointed me about his portrayal of Falcone on yeah. Gotham was he didn't have the facial scar that True. that uh, Falcone has in the comics. It's pr particularly in Batman: The Long Halloween, one of my favorite all-time uh, Batman st stories. Yeah, because there was it's clearly a tribute to Capone and yeah. also to the Godfather and everything else. But yeah, yeah. Carmine the Roman Falcone. Yeah. 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 Great comics, great comics. Yeah, great comics indeed. So I just thought I'd mention those uh, notable actors in this one. All right. So trivia. So if you're wondering, of course, about Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker, how it compares to the comics, because it's kind of been a running theme this season. Yeah. The, this one comes from the limited series, The Boys... Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker, which was like a six-issue miniseries. One of the things that was notable about the boys' comics was that periodically throughout the run, the regular 72-issue run, would there would be kind of these spin-off miniseries that would focus on a, a, either a character or, or a couple of characters and give them a little bit more depth you know, the room to kind of explore their backgrounds, a lot of backstory. Right. So in this one, um, which I'm holding in my, of course, my hands here, 
which factors in as Volume 10 in the trade paperback collection, if you're wondering. With a butcher's big smiling mug on that. Notice Very nice. no beard, right? No beard on the butcher. Yeah. That's one. Of, so it was a little weird uh, when Carl Urban started um, doing the his performance with a beard. It kind of threw me initially for a bit, but I got over it. I but was it, throwing the opposite way, Charles, because I'm now reading the comics. Like, wait, where's the full beard? <laughs> You know, so makes sense. So you, you're you know, com- I, you're coming from the reverse angle that I came at it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So how far are you in? Out of curiosity. Well, no, I've only read I think now five issues. Okay, so you're just in the early days yet. That's good. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pacing myself because I don't want to devour it and then say I've got nothing left. Yeah, you know? so, you, so you finished <laughs> the cherry storyline. Correct. All yes, right, I've yeah. just I've just finished that one. Okay, good, good, good. But uh, but in this one, Butcher Baker, Candlestick Maker in the comics, Butcher returns to London to view the body of his deceased father. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of a connection to this episode, although in this episode, his father's not quite dead yet. No. And in London, he reminisces about what led him on his path of vengeance against superheroes. So this essentially is the big origin of why Butcher hates superheroes. And we also get the back, the story of how he falls in love with Becky Saunders, the comic book version of Becca on the TV series. And she was a social worker. Then they get married. But their honeymoon is horribly interrupted when the seven show up at their hideaway. And later on, in the, after some awkward events happen... Uh, Butcher wakes up one night and gets interrupted when the seven show up at, or excuse me, gets, wakes up one night when he finds Becky disemboweled by a fetus that was within her. And as we know from the TV series, well, she had a, a superpowered child who was much older on the TV series, but here it was a fetus, fully formed fetus that had superpowers. So we got to see the, the fetus hovering in midair with eyes glowing. So you've got that to look forward to. Nice. And a fetus that literally rips its way out of its mother's pretty womb. Much, pretty nice. much. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, needless to say, Billy does not react well to this. And uh, this is where we get the revelation that the Homelander was responsible for the rape, pregnancy, and death of Butcher's wife. Caramba. So, okay. so it's a completely, again, different um, turn of events from the TV series. And then some, I should say. <laughs> yeah, so, so be prepared. All right. But I won't go into more detail because I know you're reading, but uh, that's the, basically I, the highlights. It's all, but these comics have everything. You know, seriously, they even have, ba- you know, fetuses, you know, uh, that kill yep. their own mothers. I'm like, <laughs> just, just picture a creepy looking baby hovering in midair with glowing eyes and this still has the umbilical cord attached. And, and I thought that the ancient Greek myths were nuts. Because if you read <laughs> the real Greek myths, right, right. Not the, or even Grimm's fairy tales, I thought those were nuts. They are nothing compared to the boys. I personally recommend Edith Hamilton's mythology for Greek mythology. Uh, oh, that's a great one. Yeah. So... I actually, I, yeah. Go ahead. I've read that, and also Stephen Fry's also Mythos is brilliant as well. For folks who want to, I haven't read that. You know, one. Get a kind of a, yeah. get kind of a tongue in cheek, should we say, retelling of the Greek myths by Stephen Fry, who's a, apparently quite the scholar in that sense. But it's fantastic, and yes. uh, he, I actually got the audio book because I love Stephen Fry's voice, and so I had to listen to Stephen Fry read to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's another guy I shake my fist at with his cool, great voice. Yep. That I'm so envious of. And uh, you already mentioned that both John Noble and Carl Urban store, starred in the second and third Lord of the Rings films together. Yep. So, all right. Four topics. Like I said, lots to talk about here. Topic number one, let's talk Lamplighter, Huey, and Sen- Senator Victoria Newman, who is a character you need to keep an eye on. Just going to leave that there for anyone who hasn't watched ahead. All right. Yeah. 
So Lamplighter and Huey, um, after the events of last episode, Lamplighter has been brought in by the boys and is going to be willing to testify against Vought in hearings that Newman is apparently holding on Capitol Hill. Essentially, he Lamplighter meets with uh, Victoria Newman and says that, well, Stormfront gave the orders. He just executed them as, a, as overseeing that Sage Grove uh, complex that we talked about last episode that are yeah. staffed with or filled with rejects of compound V testing on fully matured humans. Yeah. So give, to give them superpowers. So, um, so essentially he's a key witness in this. And Huey, because of his recent injury in the previous episode, where he was severely impaled, uh, <laughs> bleeding everywhere. Um, it's miraculous he even survived. Let me just say that. Granted, the pretty much. TV show miracles, but, you know. Exactly. Well, I think it kind of helped this um, Starlight kind of um, – did she use she her powers? She the cauterized. Wound. Yeah, yeah, that helped too. So there was a little bit of an intervention there on that one. But but because of his injuries, Huey's kind of left to babysit Lamplighter uh, while waiting for the hearings. So uh, so I want to get your thoughts on these two because they do share a good number of scenes together. And, and a good number of porn movies. And well. a good number of porn movies, yeah, daytime, in the daytime, no less. <laughs> so, so what did you make of these two interacting? And... Huey and Lamplighter kind of coming to realizations about themselves a little bit. Here's the thing. I I find that uh, Huey, when he's in the zone, he's a very good pe- person reader or people reader. Right. Because at first, you know, you can feel that it's just like so cold in that room. It could almost be an operating theater. That's how cold it is there. Right. Um, but... Because uh, he's trying to make some sort of conversation, I guess, to pass the time, if you will, while uh, Lamplighter is watching these ridiculous porn movies superhero, about the suits. Su- superhero porn, essentially. And, 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 porn, to, and, and put, yeah. you know, basically porn versions of the seven as well. That, that's right. And I'm still trying to understand what his reason is, is behind that. As in, you know... Either he's just, he just sees it almost like, you know, I'm just going to sit back and watch this trash just to pass the time. Or he almost sees it as lampooning the people that he hates. Because it seems very sort of odd to me as why somebody would watch porn just like that. You know, as if it were, you know, wallpaper. Because it's literally wallpaper. That's what he's doing. He's watching moving <laughs> wallpaper. Well, um, well, I might, if I could, I might uh, sure. offer up an observation, something that was expressed in this episode that might have some bearing here. So, Lamplighter tells Huey at one point that he's essentially dead because of his upcoming testimony at the hearing. As soon mm-hmm. as he gives that testimony, he knows he's dead. The seven will come gunning for him. So, especially Homelander. So, at this point, he seems almost fatalistic a little bit. He's he's kind of resigned himself to this fate. So, he's essentially going, well, look, I don't care about anything anymore. I just want something to help me pass the time. So, just and, mindless, going to some kind of mindless activity. Yeah, you know, and it's like, he's probably going, well, I enjoy porn, so I'm just going to go ahead and watch as much porn as I can. I suppose if that's how you want to spend your last yeah. hours, possibly on earth, I you guess. know, no judgments Each here. Own. Yeah. No judgments here, but, but you know, Huey being Huey, um, obviously taken aback by this. And so it becomes kind of a little bit of an odd couple, these two. And yeah. they get into this discussion about who is what's commonly referred to as a cuck these days. Mm-hmm. In which, if you're not yeah, familiar, they, they, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. I was just going to say that if you're not familiar with the term, "cuck" is a you know popular slang right now. That's um, kind of a modernized version of the word "cuckold," 
meaning kind of a weak, wimpish, you know, it's it's designed. It's a word designed to emasculate someone, to yeah. portray them as being so weak and and wimpish that their wife will cheat on them with somebody yeah, else. I, Some uh, you know, someone that, like a real man. Like yeah, because the original terminology is a man who's been cheated on. Yeah, literally, exactly. So it's so it derives from the word cuckold, but um, but essentially it's kind of like derogatory used by a lot of, shall we say alt-right, extreme-right people to kind of denigrate those Democrats and Democrats and, and leftists and people of, per, of a progressive persuasion, shall we say. Yeah, because like you're, you're so wimpy that your wife is, that you, that your wife is being is sleeping right. with other men because you're not man enough, yeah. to, as it were, to bring the goods, if you, to deliver the goods. Regardless of the fact that it exposes their insecurities along the way, their own insecurities along the way. Mm -hmm. You're compensating for something? Yeah, pretty much, think. pretty much. Or yeah, just um, trying to build yourself up, tear someone else down in the process of trying to build yourself up in, in a lot of ways. So so they get into this debate a little bit, and Huey no, – no, I'm dying to know your thoughts on this, but, but essentially Huey talks about saying that Lamplighter – you know, is acting like a cuck and is like, well, do you want to be that or do you want to be the guy who has sex with the cuck's wife? Yes. Especially when it finds out that – and then when, especially when Huey finds out that Starlight has been arrested and exposed as a traitor within the Seven. Yeah, because Huey finally gets control of the, of the remote. Yeah. At first he tries to get control of the remote and – and Lamplight is like, he if flips you over touch the that news. remote, I'll smoke you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of right. thing. Um, but, uh, and it's interesting that once again, you know, the, the theme running through this is using sexual connotations to stick it to the man, if you will. Mm -hmm. Because it starts here, and then, of course, numerous characters will use the term, you know, I'm going to F this guy, and you want to F these people up, and all this kind of thing. So it almost seems like in this case, the theme is sexual overtones to yeah. express that. Right. Yeah. Kind of a use, essentially the metaphor of dominating someone. Yeah. Yeah. And and but uh, you know what? I can't I, I, I can't blame Huey for kind of feeling super awkward in this situation because this guy's watching. These 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 terribly cheesy porn movies. They're not even classy porn movies. Come no, on, they're no. really really bad. Is... The acting is terrible in these films. <laughs> so 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 Nick, as a um, aficionado of porn, now how would you? <laughs> no, but you know what? Here's, here's how would you rate the production about, values? A, no, here's a funny story about DJ Nick because there there have been times. Ooh, story time. When when. When, when myself and, and with DJ Nick in his youth was hanging out with his buddies and they, with, you know, yeah. possibly high or drunk on, on, on certain substances. We're not going to go further into that, but that's all right. Randomly just, just channel surfing in the wee hours of the morning and you get these, these porn movies. And we started to have these very philosophical talks about there's a porn movie with a story and there's porn just for porn's sake. Yeah. And it's like, oh, the story's so threadbare, and they're just having sex. It's, it's a terrible porn film. Where there's a little bit of story, a little bit of intrigue, those are good porn movies. <laughs> okay, so, so, you're, so you're kind of approaching it from a more of a connoisseur. Yes. A, appreciation. <laughs> from, that, a from, from a cinematic, you know, you're, you're admiring the um, production values a little bit, or just the, 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 the story content, the, the script. <laughs> You know, you're, you're not so focused on, on the sex. You're you're focused on, you know, like, am I getting a quality story out of this? Yeah, okay. right, you know, which is really weird. But I'm like, there have been times when some buddies of mine, just for laughs on a Friday, we'd get together and watch a poor movie. Yeah. And we'd actually debate it afterwards saying, oh, the plot was so threadbare. Why did that guy not get his comeuppance and all this kind of <laughs> It's actually hysterical to do. I mean, it's but but obviously porn is not made for that reason. It's obviously not done to be reviewed. But I think you um, just invented another podcast, Nick. <laughs> porn yeah. reviews. Well, I mean, there you go. There you go. Exactly. You know, cri 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 criticizing the the cinematic uh, quality of, of porn. <laughs> I guess. 
<laughs> I know. Well, I mean, I, apparently there are actually ex-porn actors and actors who do that, but that's another thing. But right. Um, but yeah, I feel to go back to the, the point is yes. I can't blame Huey for being for feeling so kind of awkward in this moment because, as you said, possibly you know uh, Lamplighter feels that his time on this earth is short and he's coming towards the end of his mortal coil. Like I said, he's fatalistic, yeah, a little bit right now. And 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 Huey's always trying to interact with him, kind of like you know, come on, man, you know, let's talk about stuff. And then you know, he finally gets control of the of the remote, and boom. He sees, obviously, that uh, the big story is that Starlight has been outed as a traitor to the Seven. It's like, oh, you know, we can't just sit around and do something. And then he, the great thing about Huey, that's why I said he's good at working with people, is he uses Lamplighter's words against him. Yeah. Or rather, he, because he, he understands that to relate to people, you have to use the same language that they do, because they then relate to you. Yes. And... And he uses those, and that's why I think he's a great communicator. He knows how to use communication. He tries to speak to Lamplighter on his level to persuade him and uses that's arguments right. again, against him, like you said. So, so Huey, um, especially after he finds out that um, Starlight has been imprisoned, and Lamplighter reveals that, well, hey – just so happens that I think I know where Starlight is, that apparently there's a secret, a special holding facility for soups called 42D. Yeah. Which I kind of wonder about that name a little bit, but, you know, maybe <laughs> that's me just still thinking about the porn. I don't know. No, don't feel bad. I went there myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were supposed to personally. Yeah, because as I said, sex is the theme here. Yeah. As sexual, in... sexual metaphors, yes. Yeah. 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 So so Huey, once he finds out that this facility is like, oh, we got to go in there. And Lamplighter at first is like, no, we don't. <laughs> but um, Huey eventually convinces him to do this and stages this rescue operation to, to go in and, and get Annie out. So... So what did you make of as their attempts as they break in to the facility before we get into um, – or you, maybe we could go ahead and start talking about it. Talk about Lamplighter. Once they get inside the facility, what did you make of Lamplighter's reaction to finding out that his statue has been removed from the conference room? Well, my first thing is the big problem I used to have with the Arrowverse was yeah. how – rubbish security was same thing with the boys <laughs> security is garbage it's right. like th this is supposed to be you know vault tower and everything else those super high tech security and you'd think they would have updated their the the, 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 the codes, reading the security the codes. Codes. yeah because he obviously places his palm on the on the reader on the palm reader or whatever it, it is yeah. and and it still works it's like Come on, guys. How long has it been since Lamplight was out of the seven? Seriously, folks. Well, you know, you figure it's a, it's a you know, headquarters for a bunch of superpower people that maybe everybody's not going to be so eager to break into it. I don't know. True. No, no. I mean, I know. But it's just, it just seems, you know, I know I'm, I'm yeah. nitpicking here, but yeah. it's, it just seemed a little bit kind of – the guy hasn't been in the group for a while. You kind of change the locks once you've kicked the guy out of the, out of the house, but – you know, just for oh, apparently you know. not. Well, maybe they didn't because now that I'm thinking about it, because remember, he was working with Stormfront. No, of course, he was working at the facility. So maybe they let him keep his access in case he needed to come in and report. It could be that because, but the thing is, though, we see uh, Lamplight almost questioning is, I hope this still works. Yeah. So he, because they might have revoked I mean, his. Yeah, uh, he might not security. have been sure about it. Yeah. But, but, you know, lo and behold, in we go, and we're, we're, we're right in the sanctum sanctorum of uh, Vault Tower. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> you are throwing out that Doctor Strange reference a little bit. Of course. I see. <laughs> kind of had to. But, yeah, to, to get to your, the, the, the point that you were making, if he sees that his statue's yeah. no longer there. Well, I was – I didn't expect him to have such a dramatic reaction because – you knowing what we know about Lamplighter so far, he doesn't seem the type to be like, wow, they took my statue away. 
Granted, it then comes out that he says, I only wanted to make my father proud. You're right. So it could be almost that of maybe you know, my, I want to honor my father's memory. At least that's still there. So we assume that Lamplighter's dad is no longer with us. So it's almost like almost he feels like it's a um, sock to his personal fact of I want to make my dad proud and they've taken this away. Yeah. And that's why he totally loses it. But uh, I, I thought it was almost over the top, but it's like, but I guess seeing it in context of you did it because you wanted to make your folks proud and that's no longer there. You've stripped him down even more so than already. He was super depressed and now he's like six feet under depressed. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, I think, you know, you, I agree. You have to keep this in its context because like a, uh, we were talking about earlier that he's already decided that he's dead at this moment anyway. Because of testifying. So he goes in there maybe to try to have a little bit of hope that his statue would still be in there. And he's horribly disappointed and is let down. And it's almost kind of like the final straw that broke the camel's back. That it's like, okay, that's it. I'm completely done now. And that's when he decides to commit suicide by lighting himself on fire. Yeah, because in fact, and there, there that raises a question as well, because it's incredibly serendipitous that he just uh, that's k- killing himself. Yeah, starts the, the 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 fire system go off, and then of course water comes down, and you know, and Starlet's able to and, free herself. And Huey is freaking out while all this is going on. Yeah, of course, because he doesn't know that the, you know in the meantime that Starlight's happily able to to set herself free because of the, the flashing alarm going on and off. Right. And so allowing yeah, the, her to the, the emer- her powers. Yeah, the emergency lights kick in, and she can apparently draw from that. Because I almost – that's why I was almost in two minds of, does he know that killing himself will set off the 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 uh, the, the uh, emergency system and, and the fact that Starlight will be able to then use – the light to open up herself. I don't think he but did. But I doubt it. I think yeah. it's too convoluted to think that he knew that that would happen. And I don't see him as being so selfless as sacrificing himself so that she could be freed. I just thought he was just so overwhelmed by, you know, this feeling of finality that he was yeah. experiencing. That he just like, okay, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm taking myself off the board now before somebody else does it for me so so as i said it was pure serendipity then that what he did yes. was able to allow uh that's my take. to escape yeah that's my take on it yeah i think so but uh but it was very interesting i thought and then um you know obviously now victoria newman doesn't have her witness for this mm-hmm. and that leads to a whole other thing going on yeah. That we're going to talk about, but um, but now at not, this to, point, not to mention it leaves poor Huey in the lurch, yeah. not knowing how the heck he's going to get out of there and yeah. where Starlight is. <laughs> so. Right. So uh, and Huey, yeah, a little desperate at this point, especially yeah, trying try to. He you know, now. What did you make of Huey's solution to uh, to get? Now we're going to talk about Annie in in a minute more. Sure. But um, what did you make of Huey's solution to get them out of the facility? <laughs> well, chopping, it is the chopping, boys. chopping lamp lighters hand off. It is the boys, so of course, no gesture is too is too big for the boys. It is like, oh, oh, look at or, or too or too graphic, right? And uh, and I guess you know this is that another example of the lengths that Huey has to go to <laughs> out so outside of his character. But but at the same time, I have to say, kudos to the guy. He thinks on his feet. Yeah. Because he, he, he is desperate. But at the same time, he says, I'm going to have to get out of here. So he's still able to keep his head in a crisis. Yeah. Well, say what you will. Huey is obviously very handy in the crisis. <laughs> so is Lamplighter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. But, but yeah, that's why I think it's, uh, it, it maybe shows that as well. Because on instinct... He's like, I'm going to have to get out of here. So maybe taking a page from the Butcher playbook, he does something the Butcher would probably have done without blinking an eye. He probably just hops over there, right. severs the chap's hand, and off he goes. Yeah. Although with Huey, it's obviously a little bit of panic 
mixed in yeah. with that decision making, probably. Yeah, and not to mention, I'm sure the guy's not used to cutting up bodies just at random. Well, if you, notice, if, hands you, if you notice, Huey was struggling trying to get that hand severed. Yeah. Exactly. The man is not a pro. That's not no. how you do it. You no. <laughs> so now we're going to criticize his hand at severing skills. Okay. Exactly. No, I could see kind of Gordon Ramsay showing up. That's not how you cut. You cut this way. <laughs> You're a complete moron. <laughs> What's wrong so with you? <laughs> yeah. That's why I kind of wanted Gordon Ramsay to show up on how you chop things. There you um, go. There you go. That's a, you know, if you're a fan of the TV show Chopped, that brings whole new meaning to the, uh, you know, if the cooking show Chopped, <laughs> yeah, here in the States. Nice. All right. All right. So on a related note, let's talk, let's move on to our second topic. So let's talk about it from Annie's perspective, well, how she got into that facility in the first place. So she goes to, um, she goes to meet her mom. And she um, she meets up with her mom at a coffee place called the Jitterbean, which seems oddly familiar to a certain CC Jitters on yes. on, on the, the Arrowverse Flash. shows, especially the Flash. Yes. So I have to That's wonder. That's what I thought of. You think it was I an wonder. intentional nod to the Flash? It's hard to say, but um. I'm thinking maybe it being a superhero show, it could have been intentional. But right. th then again, how many different versions of, uh, should we say, coffee-related puns or jokes can you use? Because we have the daily grind. We yes. have jitters. We have... So I wonder whether the folks, the, the writers, were kind of like scrambling, saying, what can we call this place that's kind of neat and gives the idea of coffee? Because you can't use the daily grind. That's taken. You can't use jitters. That's Oh, okay, let's do Jitter Bean. I don't know. It could be a bit of everything, I, sp I suppose. Or if you remember, um, was it the Coffee Bean that was back in classic Amazing Spider-Man comics, I believe. There you go. There's that as well, yes. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. It could have so, gone with your favorite thing, Charles. Yeah, with coffee. Like little dots and hot. And hot, <laughs> yes, yes. A uh, little, little side note. I actually got that worked into... Um, a comic that I wrote for DC Comics because I wrote I wrote a um, a Generator Rex story for uh, DC's at the time they were doing the Cartoon Network Action Pack, which had stories of Ben Ten and Generator Rex, the animated shows, the kids animated shows. So uh, I actually got to work that in. I I, I had one character, of a Generator Rex character go looking for a they were in a shopping mall and i had them looking for a, a a coffee shop and they just so happened because it was a kids comic i had a, i called it darn good coffee and hot that they went to nice though yeah see look at this this chap <laughs> ladies and gentlemen he is a celebrity in his own right but he acts so humble see? I'm, a, I'm a celebrity in my own mind thank you very much <laughs> yeah Oh, anyway, but I, yeah. You know, not everybody gets to write for DC Comics, Charles. Yeah. So. Well, I only Shuffle. got to write a few comics for them, but, uh, you know, at least I could say I got, I wrote for DC it's, Comics. It's there on your resume. <laughs> yes, I can, I can actually put that on my writing resume that, yes, I wrote for DC Comics. So, exactly. so I got that going for me, which is nice. So, anyway, um, so Annie meets up with her mother, like I said, and, Annie, at this point, doesn't really want to sit down with her mother. She's like, um, you know, Donna says, well, I'm not leaving town until we talk this out. You know, she's still budding, having problems dealing with her mother, and her mother is trying to reach out to her. And Annie kind of confides in her that the seven essentially do nothing all the time. It's just for money. Yeah. And... Donna's trying to reassure her, saying, look, I'm here for you. We should just get away on our own. And then there's the awkward conversation change when she tells Annie that she's already cleared it with Vaught and called them about an hour ago. And that's at that point you hear the record scratch. <laughs> and things go completely sideways from that point on when Black Noir shows up. 
to capture her. So yeah. what did you make of of what Donna did? Okay, well, to her daughter. As an audience, naturally our reaction would be, "You are such a ditz. What <laughs> is wrong with you?" Right. You should have your head examined. You should have Gordon Ramsay come in going, what is wrong with you? Shaking him. <laughs> That's right. What shoulders. is wrong? Yes. But obviously from an audience standpoint, because we know what has been going on, what the seven are about, et cetera, et cetera. Seeing it from Donna's, Donna's point of view, as much as I feel she's a, she's a ditz who needs her head examined by the right. world's best doctors, mm-hmm. at the same time, it's coming from a place of a, a good, a place of goodness, if you will, because she doesn't know about all the sordid, terrible things that the seven get up to. That's why I say, as an audience, we get the reaction of you're you, you're just so stupid, but that's obviously the reaction us viewers should have. Right. Looking at it from Donna's perspective, she's trying to do something nice for her daughter. She is like, you need a break. You need to, you know, maybe let's you and I, we can go somewhere because it's all about, you know, wanting to take her on holiday, you know, like you mentioned, Mm -hmm. or wanting to say, let's take a break and go somewhere. So she was acting in good faith. She obviously didn't think that suddenly tear gas or or whatever it was would come through the window and everything else would go south. So I think as much as she maybe isn't with the program or doesn't get on the trolley, if you will, yes. to use that phrase. <laughs> right. It does come from a good place. I still can't forgive her for taking money and making her child into a soup. That's something I don't forgive and I don't condone. But I think she's trying to make up for the mistakes that she made. What are, what are your thoughts, Charles? Well, I get. I take your point. I see that I can understand that, yes – Maybe she was approaching it from good intentions, but as we, you know, like as the popular saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's me. So the way I see it is that more that Donna was the victim of her own naivete. That yeah. that even after her daughter has tried to say, "Look, these people are horrible," um, you know, uh, you don't understand what's going on. Donna still reached out to Vaught in her naivete, like I said. And oh, un- she thinks un- to be the mother knows best. Right, exactly. She was, you know, because Donna, as, as we've seen, especially in season one, she was essentially a stage mom. You know, the type that would, uh, you know, that the stage mom in the sense of, of, you know, like with child stars or wannabe child stars – parades them out there for the to try in the hopes of turning them into a celebrity and then managing their career from the side, essentially trying to live vicariously through their children who in a lot it? of ways. Who was that famous actress? Was it Natalie Wood, possibly, who had the problem with her parents who were like super helicopter parenting. and uh, Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. It yeah. might have been Natalie so, Wood. I'm not sure. I have to ask our friend Zan Sprouse about that. She's very good with all dishing out the dirt on, on actors. Oh, she actors. totally is. Yeah, see, um, yeah, that, that goes without saying. So Zan's this incredible encyclopedia of knowledge that I, I am so envious of. You and me both. But yeah, very much a helicopter parent. But yeah, go ahead. But, but kind of like, a, but, you know, also, if if you ever saw the TV show Jessica Jones, you know very that. Well said. Uh, Excellent comparison. Patsy, Patsy Walker's, you know, um, or, you know, as Trish Walker on the on the TV show. Yeah. show her mom was a stage mom. That Very you know, Ch- Pat, Patsy Trish was a child star, a very popular child star that was managed by her mother. So essentially, like that. So, yeah. so I'm thinking Donna here, Annie's mom, was coming from the approach that, well, hey, you know, we need to get you focused and back to what the way you were. So I'll just call Vod. They'll work things out. Everything will be fine. Then you can go back around, um, you know, going to various religious events and speaking there just like you used to. And everything will be fine. Yeah, that that's her big problem is, I think, because you mentioned, uh, well said, that, of course, that uh, uh, Annie has actually told her mom in previous occasions, it's not all, uh, it's not, uh, you know, all fun and games. There's actually more to it. But the problem is, yeah, that uh, that her mom is... Hearing her, but not listening to her. 
which exactly. is the which is the big the big difference. There's still this it? big communication divide between the two. Yeah. And um but maybe at this point, maybe after this event, after being captured and locked up, maybe Donna might come around, hopefully at this point. It might knock think? some sense into it. I hope so. I really sincerely hope so because um, you know, you 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 explained it perfectly. It's the whole fact of she possibly still wants to live the fantasy of I raised my child to be a celeb and in this case to be a soup. I don't want to ruin that in you know, living vicariously through her daughter that, and stuff. And that's all she knows. She that's doesn't all she want sees to her break. daughter as. Yeah, because she's possibly done nothing with her life except push this, you know, peddle this child around. Being the stage mom. And being the stage mom. And she doesn't want to possibly see that shatter because that's possibly her raison d'etre in her life. That's all she's got going right now. So if that breaks, it almost leaves her completely devoid of any reason of what have I done with my life? Right. So it could be incredibly traumatic for her as well. Yeah. So, so essentially she pushes her daughter. She's trying to push her daughter in this other direction. Her daughter doesn't want to go quite frankly. So we'll see how it works out. But yeah, obviously Annie gets captured, has to be rescued by Huey and um, sort of Lamplighter, I guess. Kind <laughs> of, yeah. Indirectly. But, but um, I'm so glad it wasn't rescuing the damsel in distress, Charles. I'm so happy that they meet in the middle and yes. that he's not kind of like, you know, to use the Star Wars reference, I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to help you. I'm glad we I'm didn't here. Re- get... I'm here to rescue you. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad we didn't get that moment because obviously yeah. it's a different show. Because and who it, knows? it's more like you're like, <laughs> oh hey, you got yourself out. Well, cool. cool. Okay, <laughs> let's <Yeah>. go. <laughs> let's go. Yeah, that's how it worked. Now, meanwhile, meanwhile, while this is going on, um, Queen Mev. We need to talk about, I think, at this juncture. Yes. Has has been having more problems with Elena, her girlfriend. And Elena has told Mev that she's going to her sister's because she can't stop thinking about the little girl on the plane that Mev abandoned with, with Homelander. Yeah. And Mev does not take this well. Flips over a table. Way to spoil good fast food. Granted, it's junk food, but heck, she brought yeah. that, all that junk food home. I'm like, you just turned over the table with all that food, man. Come that, on. That could five second rule. You know, you pick it up. It's good. It's all right. <laughs> just quick it up, pick it up quickly before it gets, uh, you know, germs on it. But, um, you know, maybe that's just the uh, former college bachelor in me i guess once upon a time oh no i but, you know what in my viewing of american tv shows i've yes. actually found myself saying that to myself when something drops on the phone like, five second rule well, um. <laughs> five second rule exactly besides it's probably loaded with preservatives anyway it's probably like uh indestructible that's right that um so mev after this this you know awkward fight Essentially, goes on a bender, and um, her assistant Ashley walks in on her having a threesome with two guys, and Ashley freaks out about this, going, "You're like, you know, America's second favorite lesbian couple. What are you doing? <laughs> and you know, you got to get yourself back on track because you know." Uh, that's our brand. And Nev, understandably, tells Ashley to, you know, be an effing human for once. Yeah. It actually reminded me, Charles, I don't know, are you familiar with the British comedy, My Family? I am not. What's about, what it is, is that about? beautiful. It, I mean, it's, it's hilarious. It's obviously, you know, the, the title on itself, it's obviously about a dysfunctional family where you have the dad who's a dentist who's crazy, the wife who's kind of going through a midlife crisis, and the two kids. And the, these two kids, one of the two uh, who answers the name of Janie, actually yes. you know, works, works up this scam to where she pretends to be a lesbian. And her father, being on the conservative side at first, is not very happy about this. 
Towards episode's end, she comes out and says, I'm not actually gay. And he has the reaction, which kind of made me think of Ashley. It's like, he looks at her and says, how dare you not be gay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, you built it up, you know, like, how could you, yeah, how could you do this to me? Yeah, yes. that's funny. But yeah, so funny. I, it made me go to my family. But it's, it's a great show. If you get to, to check it out, I think if you enjoy good old BBC comedies, you know, like Fools yes. and the Horses or stuff like that, You'd love my family. It's it's fantastic. At least a couple for the first two three seasons are really really good. Um, you just you've just reminded me that I really need to get a BritBox subscription at some point so that I can watch all that stuff. Oh, I mean the good old BBC with. I mean I actually have had a craving for Only Fools and Horses a couple of days ago. I so wanted to watch that again because I was a huge fan. Um, but yeah, they just don't make them like that anymore. But yeah, um, and we have BBC America over here, but they don't. All they show are like Star Trek the next generation reruns it's ridiculous like there's there's more american programming on bbc america than there is british programming which is ridiculous you bring back the faulty towers the crackers the all that stuff i mean the young ones the young ones oh man that was brilliant i'm a huge young ones fan yeah bring back the good old bbc to stuff because that was that's my hero speaking of superhero stuff that was so hilarious um but but yeah, no, to go back to the thing, obviously it's a PR nightmare for Ashley, naturally, because, you know, she's like, this is supposed to be our poster and this child. And Ash- this is all Ashley worries about. So yeah, she's freaking about this. But like, I, what are you doing, man? But I think Maeve may actually finally be setting Ashley straight, no pun intended, about the fact of... I see of, what you did there. <laughs> about the fact of quit being so, so crazy about stuff and Lower yourself to the level of the people. And it's not, it doesn't always have to be, there mustn't always have to be a PR spin on stuff, which right. may have ramifications down the line on how then Ashley considers the way she does her job. Um, mm. yes. Interesting. Yes. Well, granted here, you know, maybe is going on a binge, like you said, to get her feelings out and her frustration. Unlike Homelander, possibly who goes and destroys somebody. She uses her frustration through drugs and sex because obviously we could clearly see that drugs have been used in this situation as well. So she, you bring it, you bring up a good distinction because Homelander destroys other things while Mev is more self-destructive. I That's think. right. It shows you how I guess how 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 the the characters deal with trauma or or how they you know they how they how they internalize their 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 problems. And yeah, yeah, I guess Mev is more the, the self-destructive type. And we can actually see that she has tears in her eyes, you know, when, when she talks about it. Because she's like, you know, be a human for once. Because right. she's obviously still clearly distraught over how things went down between her and Elena, obviously. Uh, and she's, she's clearly, it's like when you get to, when you find, you go to the pub and you find the drunk who's kind of in tears because his wife won't take him back. And he's just right. like, I'm destroying myself because I can't go home because my wife don't want me no more kind of thing. <laughs> and now I want to play like classic country music. <laughs> yes, there's a tear in my beer. There's <laughs> Good a tear old in Hank my beer. Williams. There's... Yes. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Hank Williams Sr., definitely. Oh, so you I and me both. That. You and me both. Yep. All right. So, so Mev, after her, shall we say, threesome, her menage a trois, if you will, um, ends up becoming involved in all the chaos of Huey, Annie, and Donna's breakout yes. from um, from uh, the holding facility. So, so me- so after um, Starlight gets out of her cell, Black Noir attacks her, and in a rather surprising moment. Mev comes to her rescue and crams, of all things, an almond joy in his mouth because he has a tree nut allergy. And, oh, and a little side trivia. Now that I'm thinking about it, I forgot right. to mention this in our trivia section. Apparently, the actor that plays Black Noir suggested this because he has a real life tree nut allergy. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Which is how so that a, found its way into the show. Cool. Yeah, somehow. So, um, 
So a little, I thought that was kind of interesting. At least that's what I came across in my research. I don't know. I'm guessing that's legitimate, but you never know. But either way, it's interesting, right? So. Oh, yeah. Maybe you thought, oh, let's, we need to figure out, come up with a way to stop Black Noir at this point. And he probably said, oh, yeah, well, just cram an Elm and Joy down my throat because I'm allergic to those. Yeah, we'll have to find kind of what is this guy's kryptonite who's like, uh, you know, potentially indestructible. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I thought that was an inter- very interesting, you know, it, it, Mev actually taking a stand here, yeah, against, you know, and and helping, and at the there was a very interesting moment between her and Starlight, where Starlight says, "Just come with us, you know, yeah. we we can help you," and Mev is like, "No, I'm not giving this up," or I'd like, "No, I can't leave right now, probably." Maybe because she feels she has to be there to protect Elena from Homelander. True. And or maybe because she wants to enact her own personal revenge with the whole black box of the plane and everything else. Because she's like, maybe I have everything figured out. I don't want to ruin this right now, but. I've got this. Trust me. Yeah, it did. It did leave me a little bit. You know, the time it made me left me wondering of. There's more to this. It's just that I, you know, because one, probably she's concerned about Elena, and two, because she has her own escape plan. So she yeah. feels that it might ruin that if she, because I'm sure that if there wasn't that, she'd be more than a gung ho to join the boys, if you will. So yeah. it's because I've got my own plan. It's all good, you know, kind of thing. But, uh, but you guys not... do your thing. I'll do my thing. Trust me. I'm, I'm, we're good. Yeah, and plus, if you think about it, I suppose they're coming at Homelander and stuff from different sides, so you can't, we won't see them coming, which is actually uh, more of a clever tactic in the, yeah, in the military yeah. sense, I suppose. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, kind of a war on two fronts, if you will. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Well, what did you uh, think of all this? Well, knowing what I know from, me- it's kind of hard because. I have expectations of Mev as a character from the comics because that's where I know her most from. Certainly. So in in the comics, Mev is very um, – she doesn't like to get involved. She is very cautious, um, very reluctant mm. person Yeah. as far as engaging Homelander. It doesn't want to take direct steps against him. So – so it was nice, you know, she, it was, was kind of consistent also with the comic book version where she'll go, she'll take a step, but she doesn't step too far and isn't like eager to make the big, big moves. Yeah. She takes very slow, small, cautious moves and she's thinking more long term, I think, than probably Annie or other characters are thinking right now. Yeah, to use that quote, "ripples, not waves." Yes, yeah. So I, th- so I think Mev is playing more of a long-term game here, where everybody else is playing a short-term fix. True. Yeah. In, in a lot of ways. Yeah, she's kind of like I'm in it for the long haul, and I'm also wondering: yeah. is do you think at this point we are to assume? Granted, okay, we have a whole another episode coming up, but are we yes. to assume that Black Noir is this at this point is going to die? Well, I think it's a safe assumption, but I, the question is whether it happens now or later. We haven't gotten a big reveal yet that True. is important for Black Noir. No, I, so, I, I, I know. I mean, I, I was kind of being a little bit provocative in that, in oh, that question. Oh, okay. All but, right. All right. But, you know, right. I'm saying as the viewers – would you have assumed as the, that, the, the, or as a viewer for the first time, not knowing what happens in the as, next episode, would you say it's safe to assume that Black Noir is going to die? I would say, I would say yes. It's you would think that Black Noir is going to die. Think she's but, kicked away his pills and he's kind of there on the floor, yeah, falling and and, and, and and kind of foaming a little bit at the mouth, if I'm not mistaken, or something. I can't tell. Well, he still had the mask on, so he probably was there, like kind of groaning and you know, kind of yeah, writhing in pain. Yes. Yeah. So you think it's safe so, to assume that guy? In fact, because that's what I thought was like, okay, he's dead. You know, okay, we're done with him. Right. And that's and that's understandable, but we'll see. Yeah. I guess. 
We'll see. But uh, to be- you would think he's dead. But then, you know, you always thought Jaws was dead in a James Bond movie. <laughs> yes. Or to use an MCU uh, MCU quote at the end of the films, yes. Black Noir will return, question mark. <laughs> yeah. The end, or is, is it, it? Dot, 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 question mark, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, anything else about these characters before we move on? No, I mean, I think I think we've we pretty much said everything. Is this? Okay. A, it was like a, I just, you know, I mentioned the fact of being so well. The the, the story was so written. The fact is, it is the fact that we get our our um, actors and characters coming together again so fluidly was brilliant. I'm just so glad it was done the way it was done. As I said, it wasn't, let's rescue the princess, you know, kind of like Super Mario going off to rescue <laughs> Princess Peach or, or Luke right. Skywalker going to rescue Princess Leia. It, I like that. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, because I'm a proud feminist, and so I like, I, I like my women strong, if you will, not being the damsels in distress. Girls, get it done. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> see what I did there? All right. All right. Uh, topic number three. Let's talk about Homelander. Mm. Stormfront. Ryan and Becca. So Homelander takes another step about, as in his ongoing quest to become a father to Ryan, who now he, he know whom – he now knows, there we go, that has superpowers just like him. Yeah. Not to mention once so, he tried to be like the best boyfriend in the world to uh, to Stormfront. Once again, right. let's see how I can impress Stormfront even more. Yeah. So before they do, before they go to visit Ryan, they address the crowd and talk about how um, Stormfront says, well, you know, there was a, earlier in the episode, there was a clerk that gets killed at a shooting. And in the process of trying to act like she's not stoking fear toward immigrants or and portray them as soup terrorists, stoking that fear, she actually actively does stoke those fears yeah. against the quote unquote godless soup terrorists invading the U.S., so it, it, it's, you know, something that unfortunately is, you know, Donald Trump used a lot where he would say, well, I'm not trying to stoke any fear, but then do the exact opposite yeah. in response. Well, I mean, but that rhetoric, of course, is as old as the hills. And we've yes. seen it used constantly. You know, we see it used. We've seen it used now. It's just it's it does say it's it's old, old rhetoric that unfortunately yeah. I fear will not go away anytime soon. Yeah, it's it's you know, Stormfront stoking those fears of the foreign, the unknown, and trying and coming you know, from Nazi Germany, she knows how right. to do that. Yeah, and the whole you know, you know, putting it essentially into an us versus them perspective. Yeah, the, like typically they're, finding they're, a scapegoat for your problems. Yes, yeah, exactly. Trying to say that well, you know, these are the re- these people are the reason that your life sucks. So, therefore, you should be hating them just like I do, which is horrible, right, and inexcusable. But um, she says, well, you know, we're at war. We need more Compound V, more soups so that we can combat this, all these soup terrorists. And Homelander mentions during this, after, uh, after that, mentions, well, hey, we even had a mole in the seven. As it turns out, and this is where he outs Starlight as a traitor to the group, but then reassures the crowd, well, hey, she's been apprehended and she can't hurt anybody else because we've got her safely locked away because we know what we're doing. Like we, we, that's that's right. It kind of reminded me of when George Bush announced they'd killed bin Laden. It's like, we got him. Kind of thing. So yeah. that's, that's where I went to. <laughs> Well, actually, uh, that was um, uh, Barack Obama who said that. They got bin Laden during the Obama administration. 
Because I thought it was, you know, who was it? Oh, George Bush it was Saddam then, I guess, because there was uh, there was that famous time when I remember George Bush yeah. looking into the camera saying, we got him. I think it must have been Saddam then. Yeah, George Bush Sr., yes. Yeah. yeah. And no, Junior, I mean. They had tried to hunt down um, Osama bin Laden, but didn't capture him. Yeah. And it was only in Obama's administration that they got, the SEAL team got Osama bin Laden. Then it may have been it may have been that because I re, I don't know it, yeah. it, it, it might have been referred to Saddam Hussein I'm not sure but I mean it's uh, yeah. it's a tough one there I, I know mean, Saddam Hussein was it was a popular villain for George Bush Senior during the original yeah. Iraq War of course yeah that's where they uh, they ousted him from power and he was uh, supposedly hiding in like some little bunker somewhere yeah. That's right, yeah. and now he's now he's happily having sex with Satan, or so uh, South Park tells me. Exactly, and I choose to believe <laughs> South Park in that regard. Because, <laughs> you know, those two crazy kids, hopefully they can work it out. So, and, yes. They keep having their problems. But, but yeah, uh, Satan and Saddam out. Hussein will eventually yep. patch their, mend their fences. <laughs> exactly. But Saddam... No. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, come on, gay. <laughs> you know very well, actually. Thank you, thank you. All right, so, um, so afterwards, all this Homelander tells Storefront, "Well, hey, I have something to show you," and brings her to meet Ryan. Yeah, it's like, oh, hey, you know, guess what, honey, I've got a kid. And once again, trying to show, you know, he's kind of poster boy, best boy boyfriend, because uh, right. at the time we'd seen Stormfront looking kind of sadly at the mother with a child saying, um, you know, my daughter used to look just like that. And yeah. interestingly, Homelander actually is selfless for once in a very disturbing way. Because well, it's Homelander. Says, it has to be disturbing, right? <laughs> of course. But he thinks to himself, oh, I'll do something then that she likes and win her over to my side. Kind of play the romantic card and you know, off they fly to meet uh, Ryan. Uh, yes, they do. So Storm, or excuse me, Homelander introduces Stormfront to Ryan and kind of acts like, well, hey, you know, maybe we could be a family. Because this is someone I care very special. I'm very special. Uh, yeah, someone who's very special to me. This is my girlfriend. Me. Yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, it's Homelander's a little bit of an opening salvo, hinting to Becca that, hey, Stormfront's your replacement, yep. and I'm going to take Ryan from you. Yeah. So naturally, understandably, Becca is terrified because now she's got two horrible superpowered people to, to worry about and worry about the safety of her son with. And it's all down to Stormfront being a master manipulator because we yes. know that Stormfront, would, that um, Homelander would not have a chance in hell if it were just him to win Ryan over. Because right. in fact, when they arrive, Ryan kind of looks at uh, Homelander's kind of like, hey, kind of thing and just almost acknowledges him but barely interacts and it's that witch that storm yes. wants to use a, a clean Good term word. yeah that actually this that actually wins him that, over with her witchy wiles yeah exactly yeah. with her witchy wiles so yeah. uh man witchy I, woman yeah. <laughs> but anyway, to use to, the way that, you know to use the great quote that you often bring up about uh, Indiana Jones Nazis. Yes. I hate these guys. Seriously. I hate these guys. Yes. Yeah, Nazis. <laughs> but um, so Stormfront and Homelander take Ryan to this like Vought Playland somewhere. And it's kind of like a Vought themed restaurant, you know, like a, one of those, um, you know, like popular restaurants that used to be, you know, here, say like 15 years ago, themed wait, restaurants. Wait, wait, we don't get that though in this episode. Here they just fly off. Oh, because see, I thought they they sh they started offering him a bunch of things. Like no, no, no it just it, it, it ends with with uh, Stormfront and, and oh. Homelander flying off, 
And okay. Becca looking at the sky going, no. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. So, but they do say, didn't, didn't they say that? Well, they hey, talk, they, they talk, they about, talk about it, it but they, they talk about show. it. Okay. They talk, but they okay. show. Okay. I'm kind of jumping ahead. I'm sorry. So yes, they just talk about this. You're absolutely right. So they say, yeah, we can, we can show you movies, his Homelander's movies, and you can ride his roller coaster, that kind that's of thing. Right. It's doing yeah. the whole – here it's all the commercials yeah. before we get to see it yeah. later. But here it's actually right. – the whole thing is take, they take interest or rather Stormfront geniusly yeah. shows interest in Ryan making uh, Playmobil movies of, right. of these classic Hollywood films. I really wanted to see what Dances with the Wolves was like with the Playmobil <laughs> kind of figures. I want to see Silence of the Lambs, personally. But, that's me. <laughs> but apparently, yeah, because apparently Becca's quite the cinephile. She enjoys yes. high quality movies. There you go. There you go. Uh, but so, yes. And so it, they just basically talk about this at this stage of the game. Yeah. Um, they end up uh, taking Ryan, though, and showing him that the compound that they live in is completely fake in an attempt to distance Ryan from Becca. Because they basically, the thing is they have that whole talk outside, you know, basically what happens is there's that moment where Becca takes Homelander outside. And, Mm -hmm. and here's the thing. Stormfront wears the pants in the Homelander relate with the relation with with Homelander. Yes. He right. is so whipped. I mean, like, seriously, man, he's so whipped when it comes to Stormfront. Well, she, is, again, she's a manipulator, so she's going to be the one calling the shots and, she and knowing how to call to, the shots. She doesn't even have to say a word. She gives him the look. Yeah. That's the whole thing because there's that one point where Becca kind of says, can we talk about this outside? Because, you know, they're, they're – uh, commenting on Ryan's uh, films that he's made. He says, oh, I've done, you want to see Dances with Wolves and stuff? And Homeland, and she says to Homeland, you know, we have to talk about this. And Homeland is kind of like, is, should I do this? Should I do this? Stormfront gives him the look. Yeah. And out he goes, most dangerous thing ever, you leave Stormfront with Ryan. And that's where the, the black magic happens. Yeah, exactly. And this is where, obviously, Becca is petrified of... Yeah, that 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 realizing probably, well, if Stormfront's with with Homelander, she can't be a good person. She knows that something has to be wrong with her at this point. Yeah, But what is crazy is how quickly they turn Ryan over to their side. Yeah. And, you know, and, 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 um, you know, Becca is just, you know, being told by Homelander, like, well. Um, you know, you're lying to your son and Becca says, well, you know, I just, I'm doing it for Ryan's own good. Mm -hmm. And she's like begging Homelander not to take Ryan away from her. So she's very desperate. So that, so that when, um, Homelander and Stormfront expose this to Ryan that, oh, you're just living in this fake, fake community. That's right. That. Well, what else about this is fake? And Ryan ends up calling um, Becca, you know, saying that she's a fake mom. So essentially, so essentially, so essentially, you know, they've convinced Ryan that everything is fake news. And yes. now, and now he's being so suspect of everything. I, you know, what I really felt so heartbroken for Becca because, yeah. and as, and of course, my hatred. For Stormfront just increased nth times because it's like as if it wasn't already high enough. It's, yes, it's even yeah, higher. It's like because it, stratosphere you know, without right this. Now. That's right. Without this bloody woman, Homelander yeah. would not have gotten anything done. It takes. I mean, she turns Ryan around in two seconds flat. She meets him once. She's able to turn him. In the, you know, because by the time Becca's finished making Maeve lasagna, we find that Maeve has actually given her her face to a lasagna. Yes. Um, yeah. Good, good like, eye, by the way. Yep. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. It's like, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, Maeve lasagna. Exactly, lasagna. 
you know, and she brings it down and then you know she gets confronted like you were mentioning with ryan calling her a liar and and you think to yourself the repercussions of this are terrible because you have stormland uh, homelander 2 on stormlander your... you might as well just call them stormlander yeah, call, them, call them by the ship name the ship name is stormlander i think stormlander yeah it yeah, has to be right because yeah, home front is too nice um home front yeah yeah it's stormlander it has to be stormlander because yeah, you have you know homelander 2 on your hands because he's like so hateful and it it mirrors what you know we'll we'll then talk about in our next topic of you know the way uh homelander is described as a child it seems like this is happening with ryan as well which is kind of kind of creepy but a little bit early but it's kind of creepy yeah so you know and and becca is just beside herself when homelander and stormfront take ryan away and that's where we're left with her looking up at the sky saying, please come back, yeah. please come back. And it's like, yeah, she's – and it's like what I, – I mean she's ultimate, ultimately completely powerless to do anything about it. I'm glad that, the, as I said, that she did kind of keep her stance. She didn't get on her knees and scream no to the heavens. No! Which would have been a perfect time to do it. Yeah, but yeah. they even had the camera kind of sweep up towards her the way they do when something happens and the, the character pulls yeah. things. Like, I'm glad that they didn't get Chantel to actually get down on her knees and say, <laughs> and do no. <laughs> but it would have been funny. It's all, Homelander! <laughs> Homelander! Yeah. yeah. I could, be, I could be able to do that, uh, whole, you know, do that you a little lot that longer note, if, if my lungs weren't crap, you know, these days. So, yes. Uh, lamenting the fact that I, I should be able to hold that out a lot longer. No, but color me impressed. I can't do that. So color me impressed. You can't do that? No. Sure you can. I can hold it for a little bit, but, you know, uh, as I said, yeah. not as long as that. So. Yeah. Yeah, you should have um, – I think, oh, that's going to get me on a drunk cinema rant. I'm going to leave that there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I got started. I started thinking about that. Um, so let's move on. Topic number four. Yep. Since you kind of set it up so nicely. Thank you. Butcher. Let's talk about Sam and Connie, Butcher's parents. So we finally get Butcher meeting his parents in this episode. Let's also talk about Jonah Vogelbaum, who just kind of hang out at his nice estate until Butcher shows up. Um, looking to bring him in as a witness for the upcoming hearings, but so and not what, taking and not taking no for an answer. But from what I've gathered, Charles, it's just him and his daughter Sonia in there, and that's it. There's nobody yeah. else in that. Yeah. So security not that great there either. Apparently, no. <laughs> <laughs> You just have to kind of so, say a name, and the, and the gates will open. But that's on that's on Sonya's that on Sonya though, not on him, I guess. But yeah. But, uh, but yeah. So um, so while while in the beginning of the episode, we kind of keep jumping back and forth. But there's a lot of interspersed characters yeah. in this. Uh, there's a lot of interwoven storylines going on here. So going back to the beginning of the episode, where Lamplighter first meets up with Victoria Newman. Yes. Butcher gets a phone call, and it turns out it's from his mother telling him that his father has died yeah. and that she's in town, apparently, and wants to meet with him. So Butcher, obviously caring more about his mother than his father, as we quickly determine, mm-hmm. goes to see her only to find out Whoops, Butcher's father is actually still alive, after all. Yes. And uh, wackiness ensues. So what did you make of Butcher being reunited with his parents? Well, his mom is very, very is a very sweet woman, and I think she's kind of almost, uh, how can I put it, um, submissive almost towards her, this very overbearing kind of husband, if you will. And he's, because he seems, we, I mean, we, we, we hear more about what he was like through mm-hmm. the exchange that Butcher and his father have. And it, it uh, reinforces the fact that Homelander's upbringing and Butcher's upbringing are, are rather similar when it comes to that of the fact of 
you know, being, or shall we say, as told by Vogelbaum as well when it comes to this, because he mentions that Homelander was such a sweet kid, and at five, six years old, he was almost super sweet, but he turned him into yes. the superhero. <clears throat> so, yeah. <laughs> so and we've you... talked about them being, being flip sides <clears throat> of the same coin. And yeah, in a lot of ways. And here we Homelander find out, and Butcher. And here we find out even more from their upbringing because we find that Butcher's father was just as abusive, and he and uh, he almost prides himself in look how well you turned out because of me being so stroppy and uh, abusive with you. You're the strong guy. You've you've you survive. And we've learned that Lenny actually killed himself, his younger uh, Butcher's younger brother, or we, uh, right. Billy's younger brother, and he's like. Uh, Lenny wasn't strong enough to take it. That's why he killed himself. You are the strong guy. It's almost the survival of the fittest is almost if he puts it, he almost trims, almost seems to put it to him. It's, I, I, I beat both of you. You survived. Lenny didn't. We weeded out the, 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 um, the weak, the weak. Yeah. And you're yes. the, you're the strong guy. And so look how, how well I, and you should be thankful that I made you the way you are. Yeah, so I'm, was, I'm I'm responsible for making you the man that you are today. Yes, that kind of thing. Yes, you're so tough and stuff because of me. Because if not, yeah. you probably would have been a you know a lily like your like your brother. Yeah, so, and Butcher of course blames his father for his brother's death. That's right. Yeah, so there's obviously a lot of resentment, and you kind of feel bad, I think, for Butcher's mother Connie, who. You can kind of get, you know, just in this one episode, the the feeling I get is that Connie put up with so much from her husband, Sam, and tried to act, to, tried to protect her sons from Sam, but felt that she could only do so much and was kind of either it wasn't, you know, like she maybe thought that it wasn't her place to prevent a lot of the abuse that went on in their home from uh, from Sam. Well, also possibly even out of fear, because we don't even know whether he right. beat her as well. So it's almost like the battered wife syndrome, if you will. Yeah. And then we so find she's out, very resigned to it, really. Yeah. And then we find out that, that uh, irony or karma has struck, and apparently Butcher's father is dying of cancer. Is that the, is that the deal? Yeah, something like that. He apparently only has like two months to live, as we find out toward the end of the episode. And Butcher's mother says, like, look, you know, I just was trying to to reunite you guys. Um, like, I just arranged this for your sake because Sam only has a couple of months and she was hoping that that Butcher would let it go. They could hide men, their men fences and patch up their differences. Right. Because she doesn't want her son becoming like Sam. Well, un more than understandable, but I guess here almost the damage is kind of done already. But I don't see... Pretty much. I don't see Billy turning into Sam, to be honest. But, of course, he is that rough and stuff because of the way he's been treated. It's the whole thing of nature versus nurture, which is obviously a big sort of uh, an ongoing debate when it comes to why people are the way they are. And I think here it is very much a question of... Lack of nurturing has made Billy into the man he is today. Same thing when it comes to Homelander, where we get the fact of the fact that he was mistreated and abused or just toughened up because we don't know at this point yeah. what Homelander went through to turn him from the, fi the, the, um, the sweet five, six year old into this all monster, into the, the monster, monster that he became. is today. But yeah. it, but it um, we get the concept that apparently he was he was not always this way and he was you know just mistreated to become that way almost a clockwork orange deal when it comes to how Homelander mm. became you know that kind of correction right. of of the character yeah that's a good that's a good comparison interesting yep I like what you did there sir <laughs> throwing out the old Stanley Kubrick nice. I kind of have to. And what, what what did you think of all this, Charles? These kind of father figures and, and all that. Well, you know, first and foremost, I loved um, John Noble and Leslie Nickel. I thought they were great as Butcher's parents. And you could definitely just, you know, just a few scenes here and there um, really get a feel for what it might have been like for Butcher growing up. Yeah. 
and, and all the issues that have resulted from that. And, and yes, uh, to some extent, I think it's as uncomfortable as it is. Sam Butcher is right that Butcher became the way he is because of Sam in a lot of ways, because of that abuse. Was it a good thing? Probably not. But, um, it, you know, the past is the past, unfortunately. There's nothing really you can do to change it now. Yes. And Butcher is trying to, f- can, still has the option of deciding for himself who he wants to be. He doesn't have to be like his father. Mm. So it's up to him now to make that decision about the man he wants to become. Which is often the fate of abused children is do I also become an abuser or does that make me more sensitive to the plight of people and makes me tougher because of it? And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that cycle of abuse just repeats. Yes. In in most most cases, yes, uh, abused yeah. children become abusers themselves. Not always, because there are folks no, that not I know always. That I have not spoken always. to, to I, I have spoken to folks who were male- you know, abused as children, but they're the most gentle people in the world because of it, because like I don't want to repeat what my what was done to me. But yes, of right. course you do get if you go in the dark the, to the dark side of things of serial killers and what have you, they all come from very broken and abused homes. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of kids, that, that cycle of abuse is so hard to break in yes. a lot of ways. Because that's all you know. Right. Exactly. So it's it's a very uncomfortable situation, but uh, we'll just have to see where Butcher goes going forward. Unfortunately, as we talked about, he goes to see Jonah Vogelbaum yeah. and has a nice cup of tea with Jonah and tries to get Jonah to come with him to provide evidence at the hearings, Jonah not so down with this. So Butcher decides, well, okay, I'm not in a really great place right now, so how about you either come with me or I murder you and your entire family? That's right. Well, I think he might actually leave him alive to kind of see him do it because he's like, I'm going to go into the other room, bash your daughter's head in, then I'm going to go and find your sons and their wives, kill them. Yes. And then kind of come back. So it's almost like I'm going to spare you because the psychological torture will be unbearable for you because I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to kill, destroy everything that surround that is within your your intimate yes. circle. Almost kind of like what Kingpin did to Daredevil in one of my favorite Daredevil storylines where – the kingpin destroys everything that's near and dear to Daredevil, but does not destroy him. Born again, if I'm yes. not mistaken. My yes. favorite, my favorite Daredevil storyline is Born Again for that reason. Yeah. It shows you how manipulative and amazing, what an amazing villain the kingpin is when done properly. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, highly recommend storyline by Frank Miller and David Mazzuchelli. Correct. So yeah, highly recommended. Um, so. Butcher persuades, shall we say, Vogelbaum to come with him. Vogelbaum testifies at the hearing. But just after being sworn in, the chairman's head explodes and then Vogelbaum's head explodes. And a bunch of other spectators in the during the hearing, their heads explode just randomly. They start popping like daisies, you know. It's like it's like a bag of microwave popcorn. Right, exactly. So <laughs> to um, use some dark humor there, but that's what yeah. reminded me of. Because I guess yeah, I kind of I had popcorn ahead. that night, and so I was like, "Oh, that's kind of like when I was microwaving popcorn about an hour ago." <laughs> <laughs> so you almost uh, start expecting some John Philip Sousa to start breaking out, going. Kind of like, in, you know, like in Caddyshack, if you ever saw the movie Caddyshack. Yes. So that's what I'm thinking of, right? During the explosions at the on the golf course. That's where my head goes. So um, I believe it was Sousa anyway. But um, so everybody understandably freaks out. Um 
Grace Mallory gets Senator Newman out of there, yeah. interestingly enough. So everybody else, like the members of the boys, are watching all this happen unfold live on TV. And Huey, as the episode ends, is like, so what do we do now? And nobody has an answer for him. That's right. And that's where we left off. That, yeah, exactly. That's where the episode To be comes... continued. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, that's where the episode comes to a close. So, Talk about so the ending, the, yeah, ending the episode with a bang and another <laughs> bang and another bang and another bang. Yeah, I think yeah, to, to go back, I think yeah, I believe it is Sousa to be. Uh, yeah, I think so. You, you are correct. Yay. I believe so. Yes, because there's also they also do that. Uh, it's also in uh, V for Vendetta, which is used a lot. So I, I yes. uh, V for Vendetta. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe it is Sousa because I yeah because I actually have the the soundtrack for V for Vendetta and of course that track features heavily in it. So yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you, thank you, Nick. Uh, I wasn't going too crazy there by <laughs> no, remembering it that you way. Know your stuff, Charles. Come on. All now. right. All right. If nothing else, I'm good at faking my way through. <laughs> All right. So, anything else we haven't talked about this episode? I know we haven't talked about the deep in the church. Well, yes, because there is, of course, if we want to mention it briefly, the fact that uh, yeah. apparently the that. Um, the president of the Church of the Collective is going to be sitting down with Vought, and um, he's giving Alistair her... Adana, by the yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, and he's giving he's giving a train and uh, and uh, the deep hope that they might that he uh, will be talking to Vought about them and getting them back into the seven and what have you. And we find out also that um, the non Hawkeye guy in this in this uh, Eagle the Archer, yes, yes. Well, aka Eagle the Archer is actually a terrible person, or rather he's been ostracized completely from the Church of the Collective. They don't want, they, they want nothing to do with him. And that's where, the, they, where we get that moment where, which is actually hilarious, where the, deep, where the, um, the head of the Church of the Collective asks um, the guys, what do you think about uh, Eagle the Archer? And the Deep's like, oh, he's a stand-up guy. He helped me through everything. And he's like, He's a terrible person. We don't want anything. Oh, yes, of course. I had seen that kind that he was a bit of a, he was a nasty piece of work. And A-Train ain't buying it. (laughs) Yeah, he completely, like, the deep quickly backpedals on that statement. And A-Train's just watching all this going, seriously, he was your friend. And now just because this guy says so, he's not. He's not drinking the Church of the Collective Fresca. (laughs) No, no, not at all. That's I'm going to give points to Nick on that one. Points. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I don't see what the big deal is. You know, hey, uh, maybe Eagle, you know, it just he just happens to like uh, a part, sexual partners wearing dressed up like deer. Yeah, so, that's a yeah, kind of like, like, So, so me, he's just, you know, he's a, a furry aficionado. So, <laughs> yes, everybody has their own fetish, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But apparently, yeah, they don't. The Eagle the Archer has now been officially ostracized from the church, and now Adana expects everybody else to disown him as well. Yeah, to, to, to tell that line, yeah. So I guess we, that's kind yeah. of what we what we got there was pretty much that. And uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, and A Train. I mean, he seems like he's you know he's happy. He, he it's more of a means to an end of getting him back in the seven. Rather yeah. than by, than towing the party line, if you will, when it comes to church, the collective. Yeah, Atrian could care less about the church. All he cares about is getting back in the seven, and he's just playing along. Yeah. Where, this point. Whereas I guess I think the deep actually buys into it more. Plus, he got a beautiful wife out of it and everything else. Right. Like, yeah, this is cool. This works for me. Yeah, I'm good with this. Yeah, exactly. So, so we'll see what happens. All right. Mm-hmm. So, anything else you want to no, talk about? All, all in all, I think we, we, we pretty much uh, said Covered everything it. needs yeah. to be said. I mean, it was a jam-packed episode, and I think we did our best with all our tangents here and there. But I think I think pretty yeah. much we, we, we got her done, as Larry the Cable Guy would say. Oh, interesting reference. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure Zan would approve, but we'll see. We'll see you on that one. We'll have to what wait for the judge that? to come in. When, when, right. when, you, when you run a country show, you have to, of course, reference Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. All right. I, I guess I have to give you that one. All right. 
So do you have any favorite quotes? I have a couple. Um, when it comes to the exchange between uh, Huey and Lamplighter, where <laughs> Huey says to Lamplighter, you're not the cuck, I'm the cuck. And Lamplighter's like, actually, you're worse. You're the cuck fluffer. <laughs> that was fun. And um, I know you have the one quote, Charles, so I'm going to leave that one to you. But the one that I did want to want to um, mention was Victoria uh, saying, you know, opposition's going to have a field day with him. Disgruntled ex soup. I'm fairly sure he's effed half the Sacred Heart cheerleading squad. But yeah, nice. he'll be a good witness. It's not enough, though. And Butch is like, not enough. If torturing and burning a bunch of mentals on Vault Say So ain't enough for you Muppets, then what the F are you good for, huh? A strongly worded tweet. <laughs> Nicely read, sir. Nicely read. Uh, that's, yeah, that's that was good. Mine. Um, let's see. On a related note, I have Butcher with Victoria Newman, where Butcher says, Congress, please. What a bunch of corrupting effing C's they are. I have to be very careful with that. And Victoria replies, come on, you're not the first person to call me a C, Mr. Butcher. I'm starting to think it's like a badge of honor. <laughs> yeah. And let's see, Huey the Lamplighter saying, look, this isn't healthy. You can't watch porn while the sun's out. <laughs> yes, I knew you were going to go with that one. <laughs> that was a good one. It's hilarious. And again, Huey the Lamplighter saying, do you want to be the cuck or the guy who Fs the cuck's wife? <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, what's your rating for this one, sir? I'm going to give this eight and a half out of ten. Uh, whoa, what's, what's a good one? Oh, um, I suppose um, – uh, human combustions. Okay. Yeah, where are the exploding heads or yes. something? There we go. Well, I'm going to be a little more generous than you. I give this one nine. Ooh, I really okay. like this one. Nine out of ten severed hands for fingerprint access. Nice. And my backup, in case you stole that one, was going to be Almond Joys. Ooh, okay. And I still have to taste Almond Joys. Let's see if they're as bad as they say. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I don't. <laughs> eat them i'm not a big fan of almonds anyway so i've never oh, eaten the candy okay. bar so i can i can't testify to the quality of I, that I don't know bar. i mean I, my grandma was a big fan of sugared almonds okay but, uh but you know i i i only have tasted almonds in panettone which is a sweet uh, thing that we have over the holidays but never tried uh, almond joys yeah. yeah i usually only eat candy bars that are chocolate without almonds in them so oh. Hey, uh, to each their own. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but um, now, Phantom Zone fan mail, we did get some fan mail from Dave Proctor, who just squeaked in under the wire as we were recording this episode. Oh, wow. So it's like a buzz beater kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, he, I just got his email about a half hour ago yeah, well, as we were talking. Well, Dave beat the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. So uh, cutting it a little close there, Dave, but <laughs> but I got to read it, right? So because he's writing about Butcher Baker, Candlestick Maker. He says, I both, I hope you both are doing well. well thank you, Dave. Thank hope you, you're Dave. doing, you and your family are doing well. Yes. Welcome to the holiday season. I hope you're enjoying doing this podcast as much as I am enjoying listening to it. Well, thank you. Well, we I think we are. We're having, a, hopefully, we're, we're having a blast. Hopefully you're enjoying it more than we are doing it, though. <laughs> oh, we're, we're enjoying having, it. We're, we're enjoying are. doing it. So, yeah. We just want you to enjoy it more than we are. Yes, for sure. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's not selfish at all, right? Oh, you know, we, just want, we want you to enjoy it more than we do. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Art imitates life, he continues, as we see right the right stirring people into a frenzy. Yep. Starlight and her mother got together and Starlight lost her faith. So many things in her life, so many things in her life that she has relied on, on are failing her now. True. Then Black Noir attacked the coffee shop. This will further strain Starlight's ability to have a normal life. Hmm. Butcher's mother calls and lies about his father dying in order to get them together. I guess everyone has family problems. Slightly. Star Starlight is publicly declared a traitor. 
Butcher's dad is Sherlock Holmes's dad, too? And I mentioned this earlier in the episode. Butcher and Sherlock are brothers? Well, sort of. Kind of. In different, in different fictional humor, TV universes, but sure, why not? Let's just go with that. Mev is having relationship problems. Isn't it fun when your boss wants to fix your personal life? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't really call Ashley her boss because mm. I can't see Mev thinking of Ashley as her boss. Mm. Now, maybe Vought, but yeah. And yeah. she's the Vought representative, I guess. Yeah, you know, J. Edgar, I can, you know, Edgar, I can understand, but. Yeah, Stan Edgar, Stan Edgar yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jay Edgar is the FBI. The FBI. That, that, that terrible yeah. president. Yes, the worst uh, Hoosier ever to be a president. Yes, he was never president. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay. No, he was. The, he was just the head of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Okay, yes, because he started that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Dave continues. It is it possible that the Deep is delusional about talking about fish talking to him? I know he has powers, but there are people in the real world that hear voices in spite of people actually being able to speak to them. Perhaps he has powers in psychosis. Hmm. Interesting theory. So what does that say about Aquaman? Or Namor the Submariner. <laughs> or Namor the Submariner, yeah. But I don't think Namor can control fish, can he? Not to my knowledge, no. Yeah, he's a little different from Aquaman in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have the tel- the aqua telepathy. Yeah, he that doesn't really talk Aquaman fish has. much. Yeah. Homelander has no idea what a good father is. Well, that's the understatement of the century. <laughs> Lamplighter immolates himself. Yeah, there's a good word you don't hear too often. Immolates. <laughs> or as I like to call it, Lamplighter flambe. <laughs> Flame on. <laughs> and I just watched Fantastic Four, The Rise of the Talk Silver Talk about Sheffield a human torch, day. right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Starlight versus Black Noir. Light versus Darkness. Maeve to the rescue. Tree nuts as a weapon. Nice. <laughs> Butcher's demons are rooted deep. He may never learn to live with his brother's death. Exploding heads. No one expects exploding heads. Not even the Spanish Inquisition, Dave. <laughs> oh, and may I also say a big yes. shout out to, to Dave Proctor also for the great job that he did on Next Stop Everywhere recently as well. Yes, he did. He did wasn't a fabulous the job. Daughter and did a great job of it. Yes, we just re- yeah we just had that out this past week. So so Dave, I want to tell you from from one podcaster to another, great job. Yep, excellent job. We always have it. We enjoyed having Dave on once again, and he's always welcome on Next Stop Everywhere. Open invitation. Dave signs off. Keep up the good work, fellas. I hope everyone is ready for the hell we call the Christmas shopping season. Stay well. Well, there's an upbeat note to end on. <laughs> Positivity, optimism, yes. <laughs> Get ready for hell. Yes, it's like celebrate good times. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Yes, All right. indeed. All right. That's why I shop. That's why I shop online. I avoid the crowds. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that you celebrate Hanukkah. Yes, indeed. Well. But, you know, but, but, you know, I still have to, because since my dad is a non-practicing Christian, we okay. have, we have, uh, a, you know, you have two celebrate, you have two celebrations. Yes. I, I'm very lucky that I get Christmas and Hanukkah together. Um, Bonus gifts. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, we do a bit of both, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I've, I, since then I've always, you know, kind of, done all my shopping online charts because i can't stand the crowds i'm not a big fan of malls and i'm like no i'm i'm right there with you i totally understand that yes uh, and especially this year right this is the, the absolute worst year to go shopping yeah i mean call me a lazy bones but i just kind of like you know from behind my keyboards doing all my shopping for all my loved ones typey behind typey, my, typey 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 exactly typey. behind my keyboard or heck even on my phone you know bye 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 done okay yeah all right so thank you, Dave. We really appreciate you writing in. Just like I said, just under the wire. Yep. So if you want to be like Dave, please write to us at fandomzonecast at gmail.com. That's fandomzonecast at the gmail.com. Or you can reach us on Twitter at fandomzonecast on Twitter. Facebook, of course, the Fandom Zone Podcast. Or Instagram at fandomzonepodcasts. And Nick, where can they 
hear more of your dulcet tones over the <laughs> interwebs. Well, when it comes to me, Charles, if country music is your uh, style of music you enjoy, I do host the Whiskey and Cigarettes show where we play today's country, traditional country, and everything else in between. For more information on that, that and how we can tune in, you can visit our website. That's whiskeyandcigarettesshow.com. <laughs> also, podcast-wise, I do host Happiness and Darkness, a superhero movie podcast where we discuss superhero movies from Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, Image, and more. If you'd like to discuss your favorite superhero movie, you can hit us up on, with an email at happinessanddarknesshow at gmail.com. And, of course, we are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Also, we do host Gold Sta- co- I do also co-host Gold Standard, the Oscars movie podcast, where with good friends Zan Sprouse and Rachel Friend, we're going through all the movies that won the Oscar for Best Picture from 1927's Wings to present day. If you'd like to join us to discuss your favorite uh, best picture winner you can send us an email at goldstandardoscars at gmail.com that's goldstandardoscars at gmail.com we're also on twitter and facebook and when it comes to the man that gives me so much hilarity what about you charles well nick first off i want to say nick is an absolute saint <laughs> for putting up with my silliness while he's doing his uh, shameless plugs. So, no, you're uh, a joy to podcast with. It's always, it's always fantastic. I'm just goofing around. I'm holding up like the butcher's big mug on the tree paper back or the Batman Funko. And I, I see it. I see this training for my stamina of learning to keep a straight face. So far, I'm failing miserably, but you know. We... <laughs> That's all right. So uh, Nick's probably just like... Sh- Leave me alone. I'm trying no, to do this. It's fine. It's, as I said, it's good practice. So that when folks are kind of heckling me, if I can keep it together. <laughs> so uh, as for me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Instagram, uh, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, and my blog of geeky things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot. Where I talk all the stuff we talk about here on the Phantom Zone podcast. All kinds of comics, TV, comic book TV, news, news of my other podcasts that I do for Southgate Media, including, well, hey, Titan Talk to Titans podcast that I do with Nick and Jesse, and whenever we have Titans or Doom Patrol to talk about. So kind of on hiatus right now. But also, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, where Jesse Jackson and assorted special guest companions like the wonderful DJ Nick join us. Oh, and Dave Proctor as well. Yep. Join us to talk uh, Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sarah Jane Adventures, and Big Finish Audios, and more. Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast that they do with Zan Sprouse, where we talk about all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch. And we'll hopefully be talking more about this mysterious new TV series that David Lynch has been apparently working on that we just got found out about this past week that is, uh, has the working title of Wisteria. So that's very enigmatic. Yeah, I've noticed Mr. Lynch has been teasing that a lot of late. If nothing else, it's going to give us something more to talk about on Ghost of It. That's cool. And then, of course, Drunk Cinema, our Zan and I's latest podcast, our little side project, side gig, where we kind of just, you know, enjoy adult beverages and adult language and then watch some uh, great movies that we both love to bits. And we first episode, we talked Batman 1989, and this past week, we discussed Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And according to Nick, he enjoyed our little discussion Indeed that we I had. Did. For not being a Ferris Bueller fan, as I said, you know, it's not as hardcore as the two of you. I enjoyed it. You guys did a good job. Well, thank you. I hope we, I hope we made it a little more interesting for you. Oh, yes. Enjoyable. And if nothing else, gave you something to laugh about. So, everybody, uh, please check that out. And stay tuned, because... Coming up for December, we're going to be, of course, talking the ultimate Christmas movie, Die Hard. Oh, yes. So that's going to be a lot of fun, as uh, we're both big fans of that film as well, as everyone should be, because it's an awesome, awesome action film. All right. So uh, next time in the Phantom Zone, episode 198, we are going to be talking at long last, What I Know, the boys season two finale. And this one... Butcher makes a deal with Stan Edgar to keep Vought, to help Vought, excuse me, reclaim Ryan at Homelander's cabin. However, Butcher reneges on the deal and attempts to save them all from Stormfront. And wackiness ensues. 
So we'll see what happens. Nick and I already kind of know what happens because, hey, we watched ahead. Yeah. But uh, we're going to wait seven days to talk about it because <laughs> we've already talked long enough as it is. Yes. So, Nick, thank you so much. I had a great discussion. Obviously, we really got into this one as well. Uh, yes. And it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe it's just I'm so reluctant to let go. They're, they've been enjoying these discussions so much. Well, well, Charles, it's always a joy and a pleasure to talk to you. You know, I mean, as I said, it's any project that uh, we get to do together is always uh, such a such a wonderful thing. And I definitely will have to put my thinking cap on to think of what uh, can possibly be organized you know, with, with myself, you and Jesse for uh, 199 and 200 for sure, because those are big, big episodes, man. I'm so happy to be a part of this. Yeah, I, can, I just can't get enough of talking to you, so much so that uh, I'm going to talk to you in about six days. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Stay tuned, folks, for that. There's something special brewing in a galaxy far, far away. So there's definitely something Ooh, special. Oh, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Very <laughs> clever. Very good. May the force be with you, Nick. All right. So, uh, everybody, thanks again for listening. Come on back. Phantom Zone 198 as we inch ever closer to the big Phantom Zone 200, whatever that turns out to be. And we'll see you next time for the Boys Season 2 finale right here on the Fandom Zone podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Ciao.